Perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming in, stopping in. Uh, first, just a shout out. Thanks, Carrie, for making this happen. Thanks to Northern Arizona, Northern Arizona Orthopedics and also to Hopco for uh, giving us this opportunity to share some knowledge and, and pass these things on so we can get stuff taken care of. Hopefully, a lot of you have questions, and hopefully we get to a lot of those questions tonight to get things taken care of. So let's get going on this one. I'm going to go to the next slide. Perfect. So on tonight's agenda, we are going to be going over a lot of different conditions that all involve the foot and ankle. Um, heel pain, because that is the most common thing that I see since I've been here in Flagstaff and down in Prescott Valley. So we're going to go over heel pain in all of its forms, and then we're going to go over ankle sprains that lead into ankle fractures, uh, how to identify them and how to treat them. That's the best way to do it. So our objectives of the time together we're just going to recognize the symptoms of heel pain. We'll differentiate between, hey, the bottom of my foot hurts or the back of my foot hurts. Um, understand the basics of ankle sprains, be able to go through uh, what's related to those conditions, the best treatments that you can perform at home, and then understand when you need to schedule with a provider and when surgery is called for after that. So those are our objectives today. Still not clicking. Stand by. Almost clicking. Not quite. Okay. Try one more. There we go. Hey, we got to the next screen. Here we go. So this is heel pain defined. Most of the time we're talking about heel pain. It's it's most of the time located on the weight-bearing surface of your foot or on the bottom part of your heel, but it can also be located on the back of the heel. 1.5 million patients per year are affected by heel pains. It's a very common condition, especially here in a more active community. Um, there are two distinct types of the heel pain. There's plantar heel pain, which is on the bottom, and that's 15% of all uh, foot complaints, and then the posterior or the back part of the heel. So the anatomy that's involved, and this is the big key that's being played on this one. The inflamed plantar fascia, that's the bottom portion, and the back portion is the Achilles tendon. The big thing to understand with these two conditions is they are interrelated. So you think of the letter L, right? Your first finger coming down, that's your Achilles tendon. It hooks into your heel, and then it shoots out from there almost as if you're looking at your thumb. And it, it's connected. So your Achilles tendon connected to the heel, which springs out into the plantar fascia. So it's all realistically one unit. You injure one, it can injure the other. Um, so, not quickly. So, the things that will injure the posterior part of the heel will also lend to injuring the bottom part of the heel. So when your Achilles gets tight, it can lead to plantar pain or pain on the bottom of your heel. So things that make that Achilles tendon tight, running on hard surfaces, repetitive heel trauma, so pounding on the pavement, um, up on trails. If you have a flat foot, which is that central picture right there, or a high arched foot, which is the picture on the bottom, or if you consistently wear higher heels. Um, those will all lead to a tight Achilles tendon, which will then in turn lead to either posterior heel pain or plantar heel pain. So the result of this tight Achilles tendon is that tight plantar fascia. So the plantar fascia is actually a broad, dense band of collagen fibers. It's very thick and it, it does not move a lot. It stays in that one position. It's very hard to move. It's, it's inelastic. Um, so if you have tension on one side, like your Achilles tendon, it will then leach into or cause tension or uh, pain along the plantar surface as well, along that plantar fascia. Um, not
All right. I also apologize. There are some graphic images on here, but it's important to understand the anatomy so that we can go through um, the different types. So your heel pain on the bottom of the heel, there's a central band and a medial band. Most of the time, the medial band or the inside part of the arch is where you're getting a lot of that pain. It connects there. And when that Achilles tendon pulls, it pulls also on your plantar fascia, causing pain along that medial band of tissue. Um, it's, it, the, the pain extends from the heel through the arch, and you'll also see swelling on the heel. The central band, or more towards the outside of the foot, it's not as common. It's, uh, it's more related to uh, it, tenderness just at that one point on the heel, and it does not extend through the arch. So your most common symptoms with your medial heel pain, it's the first step in the morning. So you get out of bed and you have that instant pain on the heel. It almost feels like it's ripping away from that heel. That is your classic medial heel pain related to that medial band of plantar fascia. Uh, it does get better throughout the day and some people describe it as a stone bruise or a deep aching type of a pain, but generally it's that first step in the morning that really gets us. Um, the additional symptoms with the heel pain, it's that pinpoint pain uh, commonly located on the, that point in the heel. And then that second picture will show, it's got a finger pointing to the medial arch. It is distended or there's swelling in that area right there. And that's a classic uh, plantar fasciitis as well, right there. So that medial arch swelling. Um, Classic symptoms for runners. So here in Flagstaff and down in Prescott Valley, there are numerous runners. And so they're running consistently. They're out all the time. So for you, the classic runner, your pain will be the worst right at the beginning of the run. It gets better as your run continues. And then right at the end of the run, it hurts almost immediately as you stop. That is a classic hurts on the bottom of the foot right at your heel at that insertion point. And you'll notice that at the beginning, better through the run and worse right at the end. So at home treatments uh, for heel pain. I, I generally start with uh, herbal supplementation. It's kind of a naturalistic or holistic way of approaching this. Um, what they have shown recently is turmeric with ginger and that's uh, given at 2000 milligrams daily. A lot of my patients will go to Costco or they'll go on Amazon and pick this up. Uh, you have to have the ginger with the turmeric. Uh, turmeric alone will go straight through your system. It's not a pleasant experience, so make sure you have the ginger with you. Um, also, that, that has been shown to decrease overall inflammation. So not just for plantar fascial pain or posterior heel pain, but all inflammation. Uh, the other effective thing that you can do at home is stretching. There are two very easy ways to stretch. One, the picture on the left is a plantar fascial stretch that's connected with a stair. The front part of your foot goes onto the stair and you drop your heel off the back side. You don't wanna bounce that. Bouncing it will cause additional issues. It's, it's like doing a, a toe raise. You don't wanna do that. Right? So um, you just drop that heel off the back side. It stretches it out and you have to make sure that you hold the stretch for 30 seconds. Anything that is less than 30 seconds allows that to just snap back into place. So we hold it for 30 seconds, uh, and then we get that stretch that we need. The other one is on the right side of the screen right there. It's the standing calf raise. The only thing, and I couldn't find a great picture of this, but the leg that is in the back is the leg that you are stretching that big toe needs to point at the heel in front of you. And hopefully that makes sense. So you take the big toe in the back and you point it at the heel. This will stretch the medial gastroc or the inside part of your calf muscle. Um, and it's very effective in the stretch. And again, with either of these stretches, you have to hold it for 30 seconds for it to be effective. Nope. All right, other at-home treatment options. Avoid barefoot walking. 
stretch before you get out of bed. This can be done with a belt. If you keep a belt next to you in bed or a towel, you can keep a towel next to you. Throw it over the, the top part of your foot, the metatarsal area, that ball of your foot, and you just give it a nice tug again for 30 seconds at a time. Ice at the end of the day, 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off. Now you can ice in a couple of different ways. My personal favorite way is with a racquetball. You keep that in the freezer, you pull it out at the end of the day when you get home, put it on the floor, right on your arch, right on the area that hurts the most, and you roll the, roll the, uh, the arch over that frozen racquetball. Or you can use a frozen water bottle. Um, there are numerous, many over-the-counter orthotics. The brand that I specifically like better than any of the rest of them is called a Power Step. Um, you can usually pick those up online. Uh, there's nothing special or fancy to them. It just holds through the arch, which keeps that stretched for you throughout the day. And then it has a deep heel cup, which will keep your foot positioned in the correct position. So it's the most effective over-the-counter orthotic that I've found. Um, and then because this is an inflammatory condition, if you can take an anti-inflammatory, it's a great idea. If you know you're going to go out for a run or it's going to be a big day and you're going to put a lot of pressure on that heel, you can use uh, an anti-inflammatory like a leave, one pill in the morning, one pill at the end of the day. Um, and the other option is a night splint. Uh, and that's the picture in the upper right hand corner. Kind of keeps that, the Achilles stretched out during those times when you're not walking on it. Next slide. So after your at-home treatment, if all of that fails, and those, that's a lot that you can do at home. Once that's done, the easiest time to come in, or it, it's better to do it sooner than later. The longer this goes on, the longer or the more that it takes for us to, to treat this effectively. Um, so if it's off and on, if it's coming and going, the moment it kind of settles down, that's the moment you want to come in so that we can get it done early. Um, our first visit together, and this is my approach to it, I hit it with absolutely everything I can because it's more effective to do that in the beginning and not drag it out from visit to visit to visit. So we just get you in and get you completely taken care of. So we discuss what you've tried, what's been effective, what you've done, and what hasn't worked. We discuss the over-the-counter orthotics. If, you've, if you already have them, I just make sure that they fit correctly and they work the way that they're supposed to. We discuss proper shoe gear, especially for runners. It's an important part of what you're doing. So we wanna make sure that you're in the right shoe gear. We discuss medications, both, both over-the-counter options and prescription. Um, I also go through proper stretching with you. Uh, handouts go to you and we kind of walk through it together. The other option, and this is my personal favorite, is with a corticosteroid injection. It's the most effective way to immediately drop the pain in the bottom of the heel. So from the time that you walk in to the time that you leave, it actually feels better. Um, we also go over and get a referral to physical therapy to improve stretching, uh, muscle mass, and they can do a number of different things with physical therapy that, that, they, that we can't do or take time for specifically in, in our office visit. Um, and this is all just to make sure that when you walk out the door, it feels better than when you walked in. So common questions about this conservative care approach. And like I said, my favorite one is the injection. So I get the most questions about the injection. So how many times can I have that corticosteroid injection in my heel? Uh, you can have it roughly every four months. Uh, right around there three to four times a year. Um, the side effects of the injections, you can possibly have increased pain for 24 hours. Uh, you can rupture the plantar fascia. There is always the possibility anytime you get an injection to have infection and you can get fat pad atrophy. Um, each one of those we go into a little bit more detail so that you understand exactly what can and can't happen. But those are kind of the big things that are possible side effects from those injections. Um, what's the alternative? The alternative is doing an oral steroid that has the same effect, it's just not as concentrated. And then the classic one I always get is how big is the needle? I'm pretty sure they're joking because they always laugh afterwards, but I, I never am 100% sure. So it's very small. It's the smallest one I can get. Um, when do I consider surgical intervention? So 
when you have gone through every conservative care option that you can, we go for surgery. And the, when it's limiting everything that you're doing, when you are sitting on the couch because it hurts too much to go outside, when you're limiting the run that makes you happy, that's when it's time to, to get this done. Um, the other one that's kind of a classic one, when uh, consider surgery when your loved one tells you that it's time. They generally know or they keep in tune with what's happening a little bit better than we do ourselves. So I always listen to the loved ones. Uh, surgical options for heel pain. Um, this is a newer technique. So as a newer surgeon, we've been, I've been trained in a lot of the newer surgical techniques. So this is a minimally invasive surg surgical technique. There's approximately a one centimeter incision. So it's a very, very small incision. I go down with a scope. I make sure that I'm directly on the plantar fascia. I visualize it. I take a picture of it for you. And then we use a very small blade to make a cut in that medial band. I do not take or release the entire band. That's not necessary. Most of the time you can get away with just doing the medial band which relieves the inside portion or the, that arch portion uh, that is consistently more damaged. So the approximate time on that for that surgical procedure is about 10 minutes from uh, the time that we start to the time that we finish. Um, timeline to recovery. This is kind of a, a big one to understand. So with my surgical intervention, with a minimally invasive technique, you have five days with the foot elevated above the level of your heart. The next two weeks are spent in a post-op shoe. Icing is needed. Uh, the following two weeks, you're getting back to life on a normal shoe. And if the recovery is looking good, you're released without restrictions after that. So it's very, very quick as far as recovery for this one. Um, uh, one more time. Will you click that one? Perfect. Uh, so, and these are just uh, classic ways to avoid heel pain. Uh, you can go with a great pair of shoes. These are the four brands of shoes that I consistently recommend. And um, when you come in and we visit, I can, we can go over your specific foot type and we can match that with the best type of shoe for you. Most of the time, it would be the top two shoes on there, the Hoka or the Ultra. Um, I found that those fit and are the most comfort comfortable for the vast majority of people. However, New Balance and Brooks also makes a very, very good shoe. For you runners, again, you need to change that shoe gear roughly every 600 miles. Whether those shoes look new, whether they look beaten up, they need to be changed out. You can get away with this by stretching daily, and yoga is the best way to stretch because they make you hold the stretch for 30 seconds, and then icing at the end of the day. End of your run, End of the day, 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off. So the three areas of posterior heel pain. So we've moved from the bottom of the heel to the back of the heel. So you've got your Achilles tendon that comes down. There is a bursa um, between the Achilles tendon and your calcaneus, or your heel bone. And then you've got a Haglund's deformity or a Haglund's bump on top of your heel bone. So those are three separate areas that can all cause pain, and they're very similar in nature. Um, so the individual symptoms specifically designed for the Achilles tendon, the insertional pain, this is differentiated in the fact that there is pain all the time. From the time that you get out of bed, for the hundredth step that you take, it causes pain. Um, rest will relieve the pain. Uh, it gets worse when you're standing on it. It's described as a constant nagging pain or sometimes as a sharp pain. It's all over on the back of the back of the heel. It, it travels from the bottom of the heel to the top of, of the calf. Um, and it's pain when you, specifically when you're going on inclined surfaces, that will hurt the worst. Walking, running. So all you guys in Prescott Valley right now that are walking up and down the heel, hills, that's where you're going to feel that is when you're going up the hill and any it will rub against the shoe and cause shoe irritation Next slide Excellent, so the things that cause that Achilles tendon insertional pain 
uh, poor foot mechanics, inappropriate footwear. So if you're wearing your shoes beyond that 600 mile mark, it will tend to cause that pain in the back. If you have a tight heel cord, if you have that fat pad atrophy or the micro trauma. So those repetitive surfaces again and again and again, smashing that fat pad down. Um, at home treatment for this. So Aleve is your best friend on this one. First thing in the morning and at the end of the day. Shoe modifications. So you can open up the back part of the shoe so that there's not consistent pressure on there. That will help with it. Heel lifts make a big difference or something like a uh, cowboy boot that shortens up the heel cord and takes pressure off of it. You can do posterior heel padding. You can pick up the padding anywhere you want to but anything that will soften that in the back. I've had patients use toilet paper, uh, Kleenexes, tissue, um, wrapping paper. That one was a little odd, but they, that one was effective. Uh, and then rest, ice, and elevation. Those are three more that are really effective at, at home treatments. So if you still have pain, then what do you do? Our first visit together, we again, we're gonna review what's worked and what hasn't. We're going to consider th uh, physical therapy. And most of the time, we immobilize. We take pressure and activity away from the Achilles tendon. So we're gonna go four to six weeks in a fracture walking boot. And then we're gonna add in a heel lift to make sure that that's raised so that we shorten up the Achilles tendon, take pressure off of it, and make sure that it doesn't move. And then we are gonna discuss the over-the-counter medications and prescription medications, so things that will be effective in both states. Um, surgical treatment options. So this is a big surgery. Um, the most effective way to do this is to detach the Achilles tendon from the calcaneus or from your keel bone and then remove the excess bone, remove the inflammatory tissue, remove the bursa that's causing the problem. So we take away the width that's on there and then we, we, we uh, wrap it or overlay it with amniotic tissue, which decreases future inflammation in the area and then reattach it to the calcaneus. The use of the amniotic tissue is, is a newer uh, surgical treatment option in the wrapping of the, the Achilles tendon, and it keeps that inflammation down and controlled. Uh, click. Perfect. Timeline to recovery on this one is considerably longer. Again, you have five days where you're on complete rest. I call it, you know, five weeks of being a princess. Your foot is up in the air. You don't move anywhere, you don't do anything. You keep it above the level of your heart that keeps that inflammation down and controlled. Uh, then it's followed by two weeks in, a, uh, two weeks in the post-op splint, and then four to eight weeks where you're immobilized in a fracture walking boot. Um, and then you're going directly from there into a strenuous or strenuous physical therapy. So we have to get you back up to where you're going, but full recovery from a surgery like this can take nine to 12 months and then almost two years to where that inflammation is down and controlled again, um, even with the use of that newer amniotic tissue device. So switching over to retrocalcaneal bursa, you have swelling on the back of the heel, pain when leaning on the back of the heels, a crackling sound when flexing the foot, and general or overall stiffness. And this comes from overuse, high-heeled shoes or failure to warm up before activity. I don't know how many, how many runners I see go directly from their house onto the trail or directly from their car onto the trail and directly into a run. Give yourself a little bit of a warm-up and then get going. Um, and then shoes that don't fit appropriately. So making sure that you have the correct shoes is a great way to go about keeping yourself from this. And click. Uh, at home treatments, a lot of these are very similar to the Achilles insertional pain. So your inseds, your leave, shoe modification, the open back, the heel lifts, the padding, the rest ice and the elevation. The in-office treatments. So the best way to get at the bursa and to make sure that you don't hit the Achilles tendon is to do this with an ultrasound guided injection. 
Um, and then after that, because this has the potential, uh, steroid injection has the potential of weakening the Achilles tendon, you go into a protected weight bearing, which means you're in a fracture walking boot for a few weeks, making sure that that stays controlled and that doesn't open at that point. Um, the surgical treatment would include, you excise the bursa, and this can be and is performed through a scope, and that's the most effective way of doing it instead of going through that open incision that we previously talked about. Um, timeline for recovery when done through a scope, three to five days again with that foot elevated, and then weight bearing is tolerated in the stiff sole shoe, padding on the back of the shoe against the heel, and then within three weeks, you're released back with a normal shoe without restrictions because we don't have to pull off the Achilles tendon, the recovery is significantly faster. Basically, it's taking the soft tissue mass that's on the back of the heel and we remove that. Done through the scope, pretty quick as far as recovery wise. Um, Haglund's deformity. So on this one, that is the bony projection on the top of the calcaneus, which can grow into the back of the heel as well. So this is a large prominence on the posterior heel. Usually the thing that will give this one away is the red coloring. So if you look back at your heel and you see a big red mass on the back of that and it's hard to the touch, that's the Haglund's deformity and it's tender with direct pressure. Causes with this one, shoe irritation is the number one. So your high heeled shoes or your stiff back shoes. So with your kids that are playing soccer, baseball, football, with that really stiff <clears throat> heel in the back, uh, that, that's gonna cause that shoe irritation, which will lead to that deformity in the future. Uh, treatments at home, Aleve, shoe modifications are the big one. Unfortunately, with a lot of the um, shoe gear that's used in athletic events, you can't alter those a lot. They need to have that stiff sole back, uh, but you can add in a little bit of extra padding on that backside. Uh, or rest ice elevation at the end of those activities. In office treatments, physical therapy, fitted heel pads to make sure that that is fitted in there, and then offloading pads. Those are both used, you can use those on shoes specifically or directly on the, the skin um, to make sure that that's offloaded correctly. And then sur surgical treatment, we excise this through a scope or you can do it again through that open procedure. Timeline done through the scope, you're looking at uh, a significantly shorter time, so three to five days with the elevated, and then back to weight bearing, and then released back to normal life in three weeks. Uh, with the open procedure, it's again five days elevated, three to four weeks where you're non weight bearing in a fracture walking boot, three to four weeks of weight bearing in a walking boot, and then eight to 12 weeks into a normal shoe. So normal activity takes a little bit longer to get back to because you have to, we don't detach completely the Achilles tendon, but we have to split the Achilles tendon to remove that uh, mass that's on the top of it. Generally, these three procedures or these three conditions go hand in hand. Right, we're gonna switch gears. So hopefully you got all your questions in there for the posterior heel pain and the plantar heel pain. Now we're gonna move to the ankle sprains, the second most common thing that we see here in Flagstaff and in Prescott Valley as far as the foot and ankle. So the ankle sprain is defined as a force uh, when the ankle is forced to move out of its normal position, leading to stretching of the ligaments, tendons, and possible fracture. So these can be, uh, they can be stretched, they can be partially torn, or they can be completely torn. So you've got multiple types of ankle sprains. So your high ankle sprains, these are a result from a twisting injury. So this is a, it's a tear between your tibia, your shin bone, and your fibula, or your outside ankle bone. And the pain is centered right above the ankle. So if you're feeling, if, if you twist that ankle and you feel the pain immediately above the ankle, you're most li likely looking at a high ankle sprain. The other way to tell this is if you point your toes or your toes to your nose, excuse me, your toes come to your nose and you have pain right above the ankle joint, that's consistent with a high ankle sprain as well. So the other type is a low ankle sprain. This is 90% of all ankle sprains 
injure the lateral ankles or the lateral ligaments. This is an inversion sprain or it's a, a toppling to the outside. Occasionally, the medial can be injured, but not normally. Uh, these are consistent with pain on weight bearing and pinpoint pain. So we touch where those ligaments are and you have an immediate pain on the outside of your ankle. That's consistent with a low ankle sprain. So both high and low ankle sprains have similar causes. So common, these are very, very common sports related injures, injuries. They're prominent with dancers. They're associated with walking on uneven surfaces at night. This was classic during my residency training uh, on the reservation where the streets are very uneven. They, there's not a lot of pavement that goes through there. There's a lot of rocks, there's a lot of holes. And so we would consistently have people coming in in the middle of the night that had rolled their ankles. Uh, and that was just stepping in a hole and it phew, snaps to the outside. Uh, and the other thing, indoor courts, because it grabs so tightly onto the shoe, the shoe will stick and the ankle just keeps going. Uh, what you can do at home, uh, NSAIDs, always, 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 you can drop into a leave. Um, that's probably your most consistent one of, as far as I'm concerned, rest, ice, and elevation. Um, then you can go into an ankle sleeve or an ankle brace. Um, those are kind of the two big ones. And I prefer an ankle sleeve. I feel like it's, it's easier to put on. They're less expensive uh, to pick up. So I prefer the ankle sleeve. And again, it's one of those that you can just pick up on Amazon. Uh, but they do have them anywhere. And then when is it time to visit the doctor after an ankle sprain? So if you have persistent pain, greater than one week, it's time to see somebody. Uh, if you have an inability to put weight on the foot, that's an immediate time to come in. If there are tender points related to the bone, so if you're pushing on what you feel like is bone or a bony prominence and that hurts, that's a time to come in. And then when there is swelling but it isn't getting any better or tingling, numbness, or burning. Those all signify, hey, there's probably a nerve that's been damaged with this ankle sprain. Let's go have that looked at and make sure that there's not something more serious that's going on. Uh, in office treatments, so our first time together, we always, always, always get an x-ray. It's the most important thing we can do. That way I can see the bony structure and make sure that there's not a fracture. Um, we discuss what you're currently doing, what's worked and what hasn't worked. We fit you for a proper ankle brace if that's the direction that we're going. We talk about proper icing, elevation, and what level of activity you can and cannot participate in. This, for the most part, uh, goes back to runners or um, athletes because they want to know, okay, how much can I do? What, what can I get out? What can I get back into? And then if it's fractured, we um, consider a CT exam. So, and yeah, we do consistently go into a CT exam. So there's a couple of different times where a CT is needed, a, a CAT scan or an MRI. Um, let's see if this one, no, I have examples coming up where we're gonna go through a couple cases where we will talk about a, the 3D scanner. So we'll, we'll come back to that one. So surgical treatments for ankle sprains. So you have a basic ligament rupture and repair with application of an internal brace. What that means. Your, if we just sprain the ligaments or strain the ligaments, tear the ligaments, ligament is connecting bone to bone. So if we rip partially or completely either one of those ligaments, that's our first and major repair. Those ligaments hold the lateral ankle together. So we need to get that back together so that you're not consistently slipping out and causing that inversion type of sprain or that rolling to the outside type of sprain. Uh, my best practice right now, the gold standard, is to put in an internal brace. I think of this as a seatbelt over the top of the ligament. So your ligament is weakened because of the damage, the strain, the stress that's been placed on it. So I, I put a seat belt over the top of it. It's got a bone anchor that goes directly into the talus and a bone anchor that goes into the fibula and it cinches everything into place. And it holds it there so that it's not allowed to slip 
out and it's not allowed to rip through that um, ligament again. So that's currently my, my way of treating that one. As far as your perineal tendons are, are con concerned, when you get an inversion ankle sprain, you can injure the ligaments, which we just talked about. You can injure the tendons. The tendons run down the outside of your leg. There's two that run together and they run just below the tip of the fibula. So if you consistently injure that area, it can cause a split or a tear down that tendon. And if you think of the tendon as a straw, you cut down the middle of the straw and then that opens up. You can see everything that's going on on the inside of the straw. It's the same with your tendon, but the inside of the tendon is not meant to be seen by the outside. And so that has to be cleaned out and then closed back up. So that's the, the way that I look at it. That's the way that I explain it. So the top picture that shows you what the tear looks like in the tendon, that is the uh, fibula kind of comes right down through that and it causes that longitudinal tear. Um, the bottom picture is a subluxing tendon. So it's a tendon that has moved out of its position on where it should be. Um, so the ankle sprain, in addition to the damage that's been done to the ligaments and the tendon, you will also damage inside the ankle joint itself. So in addition to cleaning up those areas, we go in with a scope and we clean up inside the ankle joint. When we first go in, we do a 21 point inspection. This looks over the, the inside part of your ankle, the outside part of your ankle, the back of your ankle, the front of your ankle to make sure there's nothing in addition that's not being picked up with the x-rays. <clears throat> we also remove any extra bone that we find in there. So when you have a severe ankle sprain, you can take chips, divots, or potholes out of the, the dome of the talus, the dome of your ankle bone. It can take little potholes out of there, and that can cause severe um, pain within your ankle, consistent pain. So surgical treatment when it comes to fractures. So we've got ligament tears, we've got tendon tears, we've got injuries to the ankle as far as the uh, joint is concerned, and then if it gets beyond that point, we're looking at fractures. So. If the ankle is unstable, it needs to be surgically repaired. And usually that involves plate and screws. So at this point, let's see, absolutely. All right, so with this one, your normal plan of attack on these one is you get the x-rays, go through the x-rays and hey, this is the plan that we're going to do. Now on the images that you have in front of you, there are three x-ray images, the black and white ones, and then you have one that's kind of a colored image, uh, the third one that's there. That is our CT scanner. Um, so that specific image went from, hey, this is a fracture just of the fibula from an ankle sprain to a fracture both of the fibula and an intra-articular medial malleolar fracture that needed to be fixed. So this went from a very simple fracture to fix to one that's going to take a little bit more time and effort to fix correctly. And that was all through the use of the CT exam um, that we were able to take as the patient came into clinic, we were able to schedule him at that point to go have it done on that same day, the images came back and that changed the surgical plan and the surgical outcome for the patient. Um, Recovery time on any of these ankle sprains, you're looking at five days where your foot's elevated, three to four weeks non-weight bearing in the fracture boot, three to four weeks additional weight bearing in the fracture boot. That's when you start physical therapy and then eight to 12 weeks, you're back to a normal shoe and normal activity level. So again, the 3D scanner, this is the one that we have in office in Flagstaff. So it's the only 3D scanner and the thing that makes this unique is the weight bearing aspect of it. For me, it's fantastic. I can, I can get my patients to stand in the CT machine and it actually gives me an image of what the bones are really doing at that point in time. So this is lower dose radiation, gives me better images. Uh, it even does a 3D remodeling and that was the picture there. That third picture, that is a 3D rendering of that um, 
ankle fracture. So, and it's the best imaging that you can get at this point in time. So with this one, 3D imaging, weight-bearing surface, care stream. So this is a patient that just came in recently. Just gives us a, a way to look at every dimension of what's going on. Perfect. Okay, so recent case, and this just, again, this will demonstrate um, kind of the process of going through, and this goes from ankle sprains to ankle fractures. So this specifically came in as an ankle sprain, um, said he sprained it when he fell off the trampoline, and the x-rays in the office, they show the damage. So the, so the fracture, and this isn't a great clear image, um, but you can see on the inside portion of the ankle, the, on your shin bone, your tibia, there's a fracture that goes through the growth plate. So this is a 14 year old kid who's still growing. So he's got a, a growth plate that goes through that area. So I needed to see the full extent of the damage and there's no way to see that with the x-ray. So I needed a CT. So we got it and it gave me views that showed exactly what was happening all through the joint. Um, and the joint is the important one. So the middle image on this one is the key image that we found from the CT. There is a step off. So the joint is not in line anymore. There's a step off and this will inhibit this patient's ability to uh, grow correctly in that specific limb or that specific bone. So that altered the plan moving forward to where we knew we needed to get that piece back down in line with the joint. And that was through that, um, the CT machine. So you can actually see the step off in that area. And that was all done again through the, the CT. So um, I think we may have finished slightly early, but I appreciate you guys coming in. Let's take uh, whatever questions we can possibly run through if anybody had any questions. So it depends on where the Charco is located. Uh, that is a great, great question for, we come in, you get the original x-rays, and then we get you directly into the CT machine to find out where the breakdown is happening. If it's happening in the ankle, there's numerous procedures that can be done. If it's happening in the midfoot, there are numerous procedures that can be done in there. They are very extensive in nature. Uh, they take a very significant amount of time, not only for the procedure, but also for the recovery. Um, but they're very successful. Um, I was involved in 100 plus Charcot reconstructions in my time in residency, and then another 50 plus in fellowship. So, but they're very successful as far as that goes. Best option um, every three to four months is a corticosteroid injection. That is the best option that's covered by insurance or insurance carriers. There are other options that are available. Um, the synvisc injections that are usually done for the knee can also be done in the ankle. However, insurance does not cover those injections. So they're very effective, but they're not covered. So it's usually a fee-based um, decision that you make. So, what I would recommend is doing the corticosteroid injection first, see if that works, see how well you feel and how long that lasts. And then if that works effectively, great, ride that as long as you can. If it's not, move on to that one. If that's not working, we go directly into uh, scope and we get a scope done and that will clean it out. And that usually gives you anywhere from six months to two, two and a half to three years of relief with that one. Yes, but it's also related to what type of foot you have. Um, so if you have a very severely flat foot, so if you, if you walk into a pool and then you step out onto the cement and you can see your entire foot, the inside to the outside, the front to the back, that's a flat foot. That's a classic flat foot. 
um, and that will you will cause more pain and damage and discomfort moving on walking barefoot than with a rectus foot type. So anytime you're in a collapsed foot or a very high arched foot, walking barefoot will be more painful or cause more problems in the future. The subtalar joint injection, it depends on the person and the severity of the arthritis. So you can, the steroid injection is the easiest thing to start with and gives you the best idea of what you can do moving forward. So generally with a steroid injection in the subtalar joint, it's the same as a steroid injection in the um, ankle joint. So you usually get anywhere from six months to three years, any, anywhere within that range. Um, you can, if that's successful, you can scope the subtalar joint. So you can do the same type of procedure with the ankle joint, but you just do it in the subtalar joint. Um, it's a little bit, takes a little bit more technical still, skill to be able to do, but it is something that I've been trained in and that you can do. Yes, uh, in fact, I had somebody recently that we put on a medral dose pack, which again, remember it's equivalent to the steroid injection or roughly. Um, so anytime you get a steroid, it will bump your blood glucose level, whether you're type one or type two, uh, it's exactly the same, it will bump it. Most patients get somewhere around a 10 to 30 point bump in their blood glucose for about a week or so. Um, however, I mean, I, the patient recently had over a 150 point bump, gave us a call, we immediately pulled her off of that. So that's not, and generally that's more with the oral uh, steroid pack than it is with the injections, but it's always a possibility with the injections. It depends on what the metatarsalgia is coming from but there are a number of different ways of dealing with it. The easiest way to see if it is coming from uh, fat pad atrophy, which is the pretty close to the number one cause of it, you can slip on a metatarsal sleeve. It's a silicone sleeve, slips directly over the front part of the foot. When you put your foot on the ground, it releases or eases that pain um, that's there. Um, but you can, there are newer techniques where you can inject the location with fat, you can inject the location with silicone, you can inject, the loca you can inject that uh, metatarsal area with a number of different things. Um, I'm still waiting to see if those are effective. So, uh, because those, again, those are, most of the time insurance does not cover that. And so I'd like to wait and find out if those are going to be effective before we run the gamut on those ones. depends on the orthotic. If you have a custom orthotic that is a very thin, uh, rigid orthotic, then no, not really. You can fit that into any shoe and it's going to turn that into a good shoe. You could wear that in a Vans or a Converse and it turns it into a more effective shoe. Um, but if you're using an over-the-counter orthotic like the Power Step or um, any of your other over-the-counter orthotics, yes, there is a better shoe. The four shoes that we went over in the presentation, those are the best shoe brands that I have found. The most effective for controlling both flat foot, uh, high arched foot, even just a rectus foot. Um, the only one that it's not effective with is the Charcot foot. It depends on how bad the bunion is and if it's an actual bunion or if it's related to the joint space uh, limiting the joint space. So classic bunion points out to the side. I mean, a lot of people have to cut uh, X's inside their shoe to allow space for that bunion. Um, so that's a classic bunion. If that's the case, a wider toe box of shoe will help with that. And that is the Ultra, A-L-T-R-A. -A. Uh, that shoe, if you're in Flagstaff, Run Flagstaff can walk you through different shoes that have a wider toe box. They're fantastic. Um, if, let's see, if it is related more to the joint space or the collapsing of the joint space, limiting that motion, um, 
you can start with a corticosteroid injection or there is a, I use a minimally invasive um, chylectomy procedure. So I make a very small uh, stab or poke incision on the side of the toe, go directly into the top of the toe and I remove the top portion of that toe, which allows again, that full range of motion. Um, and that generally helps to limit the pain that you're having if you're experiencing, depending on what you're experiencing and where, where it's coming from. So osteoarthritis of the ankle, my personal favorite is the scope. I've seen that to be the most effective. Patients where I didn't think, because they were bone on bone, um, they got relief out of the ankle scope. Uh, so that is my, my first. If you have to have something done and get back to work, that's the best way to do it. We have surgery on Wednesday, you're back to work on Monday. Um, so that has been an effective way of doing it. Anything beyond that for osteoarthritis of the ankle, it depends on how severe it is, but you're looking at surgical intervention moving up the ladder to the point where you're fusing the ankle to get rid of the pain. The pain comes with ankle motion. So if we limit the motion, it limits the pain. The other option is um, an ankle replacement. So depending on uh, how old you are, the wear and tear, how active you are, there's that option as well. Morton's neuroma is very specific. So between the metatarsal heads. So if you pinch top and bottom between the metatarsal heads, so your knuckles on your feet, you pinch between those and it causes pain. Morton's neuroma uh, feels like pins and needles or it will cause shooting sensations out through those toes. You can get neuromas in each one of those inner spaces. However, the Morton's neuroma is very specific to that third inner space. Um, but uh, easiest uh, ways to deal with that at home is a little pad that goes underneath the metatarsal heads that pops it up. So it spreads out your metatarsals. Um, the other one that I like to do in clinic is a corticosteroid injection. And we go directly under the ligament that, that holds the neuroma in place. We go under that and bathe that neuroma in um, steroid, which decreases the inflammation in the area. If that's effective, then we can do a minimally invasive procedure with the scope. We go down, take a look at the ligament that runs over the top of the neuroma, and we do a little cut right there, and it allows that neuroma to expand without hurting, without causing that pain, numbness, tingling, uh, or that sharp pins and needle feeling, without causing uh, extended numbness by removing the neuroma, which is what they used to do.